Welcome to another video from Cardboard East. My name is Jay. I play war games from Asia and share what I find with all of you. Welcome to the top 100 board games from Japan, part three. Now, in our last video, we put all the games into a Ticket to Ride box. And in this video, I'm gonna take them out of said box. Now, as I, as, <laughs> now, as promised, I'm gonna give away a game in every single one of the videos in this series. Last video, we gave out Walk and Roll and the expansion, The Korean Wave. Both are excellent games from Origami, not a Japanese publisher, but a Singaporean publisher and one publisher that you should pay attention to. Now I've already reached out to our lucky winner. And if you want to win a game from this video, stick around to the end of the video and I'll tell you how to do it. Number 80 is Planet Pita, which is pocket crokinole. Yeah, it doesn't fit in your pocket, but have you seen a crokinole board? If you're not, if you're not familiar with crokinole, crokinole is an amazing dexterity game out of Canada. But the board is quite expensive and Huge, but I definitely think it's a worthwhile investment. If you're looking for something that you can fit in your backpack and take to your friends, then Planapita is an excellent one to consider. Planapita is crokinole, but done with magnets. If you can see here, all the pieces were here and they fit onto the board. I was gonna put these pieces into baggies, but it couldn't fit. But then I realized, oh, they're just magnets. I just put them on the board. What's really cool about this is that it plays up to six players. I don't recommend it at six. I think the base game of two, three, and four are the perfect amount. Because once you get to those higher numbers, I hit my disc in, and then I gotta wait for like five or six. The board stays completely different, and then I attack. I think it's best fits at the two to four player range. But essentially, you're gonna have this little rocket here, and you're gonna take your disc, put it on the rocket, and you're gonna flick it onto here. And you'll see that there are three concentric circles here. Uh, each one is going to be worth different points each round of the game. Once you put it there, you can have it side if you want to take your little alien and keep it here, where it's a lot more mobile, it'll be worth more points. Or you can flip it upside down and then it becomes almost like a bumper. However, it'll be worth uh, fewer points. And what do I mean by points? So, well, at the end of the round, you're going to count up the pieces here in the concentric circles, and then whoever has the area majority will win said points of these areas. And you do this, wash and repeat a few times, and that's the game. But I really want to say that the magnets add something really special to this game. What's really cool about it is that there are all these little pieces as well, and they attach to the piece, which is really, really, really cool. It adds this extra level to the gameplay and it adds, it makes it really, really cute and approachable. I play this game with kids and adults and both parties seem to like it. I don't think the game outstays its welcome. I think the game is better at the lower player count because there's a little bit more strategy and tactile maneuverability there. Oh, you're hitting me here, then I can kind of go in, I can go for the outer ring, I can go for the middle ring. Once you get to the higher player account, it's a little bit more chaotic and I like to keep it tight at two, three, or f even four. What I like more about this than Crocodile is one, it's smaller, fits in a backpack. Two, it can play multiple players. This game came out last year, and I think it's definitely worth looking into, and it's definitely fun for the whole fam. Uh, one benefit for this game is that it came out last year, so it should be, or two years ago, and it should be fairly easy to find. I believe that you can find copies of this on Booth, and you can even reach out to the publisher directly on Twitter, and I'm sure they will help you find a copy. <laughs> Number 79 is Carta Marina from the Japanese publisher Yuchiro House. Now, I have mentioned this publisher in my previous video on the count list when I talked about Ghost Snap. This is another one of their games. This publisher focuses on two player cooperative games. And I think it's fantastic that there's a publisher out there focusing on these and this specific niche. Now, this is the second edition of this game. It was picked up by Arclight Games which is a much bigger publisher, one of the biggest in Japan. If you've never heard of Arclight Games, they're the ones who run Game Market, which is the big game board game convention in Japan. Now this second edition has this excellent level of chrome. All the pieces look fantastic. This is a cooperative game where you are pirates on a boat and you are trying to get from point A to point B. And there's an actual map that you actually have to go there. And it plays similar to the Pandemic where both of you have special unique powers and you're taking turns either dumping water off the boat or steering the boat and getting it from point A to point B. 
That sounds fine, but did I mention that well, your boat is also being attacked by a Kraken, this large beast that's coming here and attacking and damaging your ship? And then, yeah, your ship is also taking on water. And then your boat also moves, so the water will shift side and side, north, south, east, west. And the gameplay is actually really, really smooth, albeit very, very difficult. This game is, is not easy. At least with Pandemic, there's this nice little arc. You slowly get into the game, the game picks up momentum, and then it gets really hard towards the end, and hopefully you make this Hail Mary play, and then you win the game. This one just sends you right into the deep end immediately, and you are in this process of slowly counting cards and making sure that you have enough cards to play, and you can throw cards away to make them stronger to, so you can steer. But at the same time, you're making that draw deck thinner and thinner. So every time you shuffle it, there are going to be more and more bad cards that come out. Now, that game is fine. More than fine. But Arclight decided to make it a campaign game. Instead of one map, they give you five. And then they give you more additional powers, more additional items, and more players that you can unlock. And they even included a nice little storybook here that I have never read because I don't read Japanese. But they included this little campaign guide that has this whole story written out for you. Like, who does that? Who takes the time to do this? And I think this is fantastic. And they didn't really have to do that, but they went that extra mile and totally did it. And that is why this is on the list of the top 100 games from Japan. Now, this is the second Oink game on this big list. And this is the game that built Oink. Now, I, I wanted to rank this higher, but part of me just wants to not like this game. I agree that it's a really good design, and I think it's very well done, but I just never won, and it really frustrates me. Deep Sea Adventure is an excellent push-your-luck game where all of you are divers? Divers with a giant ancient, like, bubble head thing, and you're jumped off your boat, and you're going deeper and deeper into the ocean. And as you trek lower and lower, maybe you find a rock, and then maybe you bring it back up. But the problem is, is that once you get up to the top, it makes all the air less for everybody else. So it becomes this race of coming down, picking up something up, and once someone's out, well, there's less air, and so everyone is running back to the submarine the best they can. The trick is, is that all the bad treasure is up close, the medium treasure is here, and all the good treasure worth tons of points that I never get is here towards the bottom. So if you want one of these, then you gotta be really lucky with those dice rolls. Now, roll and move has never been a big thing for a lot of people, and some people think it's ridiculous, but I think that it works really, really well in this game. Oink specializes in really good graphic design, and taking a game and stripping out all the chrome, all the unnecessary mechanics, and leaving a very simple game that works. And Deep Sea Adventure works. Number 77 is Lost Legacy. Spoiler alert, I don't like Love Letter. I, I don't know what it is. Ah, I just, it just doesn't, doesn't gel with me. I played it, it's not gonna be anywhere on this list. But I like Lost Legacy even more than Love Letter. It's the same thing where it's just a deck of cards and you draw a card and you play a card. You draw a card, you have two cards in your hand and you choose one to play and it affects the area around there. What's interesting over the years is seeing how this one simple game has influenced a lot of Western design games since it came out. But what pushes this more uh, above Love Letter uh, for me is that there's this extra layer of bluffing into the game. Because one of the cards you can never play, and it's the Lost Legacy, and it stays in your hand. And if it's in your hand, you have to be a complete poker face and pretend it's not in your hand at all. And then if for some reason you make it to the end of the game, which is like maybe 10 minutes, and everyone is there with a card in their hand, well, players will take turns guessing who has the Lost Legacy. And there's this little layer of bluffing there that really changes the game for me. Because bluffing for me, is one of my favorite mechanics because it forces players to get into the minds of their opponent. And what's really cool about this version of Lost Legacy is that, well, there are two games in here. There's one that's a little bit more calm, a little bit more strategic, and one that's more in your face and take that. And you can actually play this one, or you can play this one, or you could 
combine the cards together to play with either more players or to create your own version of Lost Legacy that you like. And Love Letter doesn't do that. I like the little flexibility here for the gamers itself, and I can play this with two. I wouldn't like it at two, maybe three, uh, definitely four, but even with six players, it works really, really well. And that's why I like Lost Legacy. Number 76 is Fairy Concerto, one of the newest games on this list. Fairy Concerto comes from Ujibukoya. Ujibukoya is known for the amazing meeples that this company makes. Uh, if you want to think of Simon is to miniatures, as Uchibukoya is to meeples. Even other Japanese publishers uh, work with Uchibukoya and Uchibukoya provides meeples for their games. That's how amazing their meeples are. Now, Fairy Concerto is a very, very straightforward drafting game. But instead of drafting cards like you do, like a la, like Sushi Go or Seven Wonders, you are drafting fairies. Fairy meeples. Fairy meeple musicians. Now, drafting meeples is a little tricky. It's not as easy as cards, uh, but you're never drafting many meeples. It's usually like six or so, and it's pretty easy to fit into your hand, and pretty easy to discern like which ones they are. And you're slowly putting them into your little orchestra. Everyone is creating a little orchestra, and you're gonna do two rounds of drafting, and then whoever has the best orchestra wins. And this is done by all these little milestone cards out in front. Whoever has like the even celebrity of that time, whoever has a majority of that, whoever has the best pianist, whoever has the best conductor, yada yada yada, whoever has the most of whatever set collection is going on, then you'll score even more points. You also have these little scoring cards uh, that you'll have at the beginning of the game and that'll determine like how many trumpets you want, how many violinists you want, and you'll slowly build up your, your orchestra. And it's just really straightforward and there's nothing wrong with a very straightforward game. I really like this game because it's just one, it's just gorgeous to look at, it's very Instagrammable, it looks really, really beautiful, it, everyone kind of gets into the game, and it's really interesting that you have like these little tiny fairies that you're making, this little orchestra, and it almost it feels as if they're playing just for you. But the teach is usually like one or two minutes, not that long at all, and then you can get into the game. And there's even a solo version that's actually pretty decent. So if you are really into drafting games and you want to try something a little bit different, I think Fairy Concerto is something worth playing. Bonus note is that Fairy Concerto also comes with an English rule book. And the English rule book is, in my opinion, way overwritten and it could have been simplified, maybe cut in half, but you could read through it really quickly, usually like 20, 30 minutes, and then you're ready to rock the game. Number 75, Dandelion. Now, this is a reprint. Many, many years ago, a Japanese game came out called Birth. And then Board Game Tables picked it up, redid the art, redid the components, launched the Kickstarter, and then released Dandelions. Now, Dandelions, in my opinion, proves that roll and move isn't a terrible mechanic, and it can be an amazing mechanic if done well. Typically, in roll and move games, you usually have one little avatar, one little token, you roll the die, and then you move it X number of places. A lot of people don't like that because they feel that it's heavily relied on randomness. In this game, you have a whole bunch of dice, and you just roll them out, and then, throughout the course of the game, you you choose which die to move your pawn around the track, which is really, really interesting because you use the dice and the dice slowly become like this air and majority that's placed on each pedal. This can be played with two to three players. It's really straightforward. The teach is maybe two or three minutes. But what I like about this game is that even a child can play and there is still depth and room to explore the game. What's really interesting is that even though this game is only 15 minutes, I do leave the game feeling fulfilled. Like I do feel like I did make some solid choices and I did make some bad choices. This is everything that a filler should be. One thing I would like to say is, is that the scoreboard is a dry erase board, and I haven't seen that before. And I think it's really, really neat, really good, echo friendly, brilliant. Now, for such a simple game, board game tables didn't have to go into the level of production that they did, but all the pieces here are absolute quality. I've been really, really impressed with all of the productions. Board game tables has been picking up a few games from Japan and then republishing them and releasing them in the West, such as Nine Lives, which is a trick taking game. Second Pizza Deliverers go to the ghost town which is paper pencil deduction game but all three of these versions made by board game tables has been better than the japanese release in terms of opponent quality and just how gorgeous it looks on the table so people are always asking me jay how do i get these games from japan well one watch the video that i made two 
look for publishers that are bringing games from the east to the west, such as Board Game Tables, and they did an excellent job with Dandelions. Number 74 is The Ravens of Three Sahasri. I think I said that right, but I'm pretty sure I did it. This is one of the most unique two-player games I've ever played. I've never played another game that feels like this or looks like this in any shape or form. Now, this is the second edition. This was done by Osprey Games. They picked this up. Again, just like board game tables, they redid the art, redid the cards, made it a little bit shinier and added a campaign game. But this is really unique. It's between a boy and a girl. The girl's in a coma and you are Leonardo DiCaprio diving down into her dreams. You have to go to dream letter one, two, three layers down. Now, how this works is that it's an asymmetrical gameplay. The boy is drawing cards and placing them into this weird Ottman shape that he's using to cover up pieces, cover up cards, and using them to have his own little mini game. And then the girl will have to pick one card and, and try her best not to destroy the artwork that he created. Because if she picks the wrong card, it could split the fraction in half. It could make it even more difficult for the boy. Or if she does the right job, she can give him the necessary clues so that he knows what's inside her heart. And what's inside her heart are just three cards from the deck. So it's a very asymmetrical game and you can't talk throughout the entire game. And so there's a, there's a problem. The only problem that I have with the game is that the two sides are very, very different in the sense that it's very interesting what the boy's doing. He's taking his time, he's slowly uh, piecing this little puzzle together, and the girl's just sitting very quietly and then just picks one card. But don't be confused, like that her choice is really, really important, and really impacts the boy. However, there's a lot of discrepancy there because her, her turn is quick, and then his turn takes a long time because he's constructing this giant Ottman, this giant shape with all these cards. That being said, this game is really, really fascinating and I think it's very rewarding. So if you have a roommate or a significant other and you are going to play this game again and again and again and you could slowly get into each other's mindsets and create as if like a second language between the two of you, you can enjoy a diving deeply into this game because I definitely think it's worth it. Now, Osprey Games decided to add these three little envelopes here. If you did X, then you could open up envelope one. If you did Y, then you could open up envelope two. If you did Z, then you could open up envelope three. And the envelopes have like this extra little bit of story in here and like, spoiler alert, actually a little story here and they changed the rules very slightly. That's kind of it. While I don't really care for that, I don't feel like it adds that much. I'm glad that they did something, but I don't think it's necessary to the game. I think the base game itself is more than enough. This game is also incredibly difficult. Not only I love card games, but I love card games with massive cards. I just find them really, really compelling. If you are into card games as well, uh, and you like things that are asymmetrical, and you want something that you can deep dive into, and really explore, and take your time exploring all the nooks and crannies, this is something that I would recommend. Number 73 is Before the Guests Arrive. This is the latest game from publisher Sashi and Sashi, and I think probably the simplest of his games. This is a really simple set collection card game where you just splay out these cards and you either take a row or a column. And eventually you will have to take things or people and then you assign these things to a person. They complete a set and they flip it over. And then at the end of the game, whoever has the most points wins. Again, just like Fairy Concerta, this game is very, very straightforward. Not too difficult to teach, that you could teach the game in under two minutes. This is definitely a filler game, nothing that's really heavy. And as everything a filler should. Like, it doesn't take that much time. You're still offered plenty of really interesting decisions. And there's a lot of gameplay going back and forth. I don't think it's very deep. What you see is pretty much what you get with the game. And again, you have Takako Takarai's amazing artwork. And you use the art again from the previous game in front of the elevators, which is farther down the list. But it's definitely a nice light game that I think is definitely worth picking up, especially if you're looking for games that are very approachable for people who are new to the hobby, or if you have kiddos coming to game night. Number 72 is Catchy. Now, Catchy is a very tiny pocket game. I absolutely adore it. This is a trick-taking game specifically designed for two players. And usually trick-taking game at two is a giant red flag and I'd run away. But for some reason in the last few years, like publishers and designers have done a really good job with designing two-player trick-taking games. Now, Catchy came out a few years ago, and it came out roughly at the same time that Jekyll and Hyde did. Jekyll and Hyde is a two-player 
uh, trick-taking game, and you will not see this on this list because, well, it's not from Japan, it's from Korea. And people asked me at that time, uh, me and my friend of mine who lives back in the States, he constantly asked me, like, Jay, do you like Catchy more or do you like Jekyll and Hyde more? Well, I have to admit that, you know, like Mandu Games, like the production of Jekyll and Hyde is far beyond uh, Catchy's. And it even comes like a little metal mini of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Really amazing. But Catchy, I think, is the better game because there is a little bit more control that you have with your hand. What's really interesting is that depending on the card that you play, the cat will flip over and his mood might change. So all of a sudden he'll go to the higher card or all of a sudden he'll, he'll get upset and he'll go to the lower card. And it creates this very interesting dynamic of the gameplay. The cards are very simple. Uh, the only thing that you see in this game are these little uh, tokens here. And I really should replace these with little cat meeples and I should really you should really get on that. Uh, one thing though is that this game does not come with uh, English instructions. However, English instructions are available online. You can print them out like I did here. But essentially, the game is just this. This tiny little deck of cards. And it's really fascinating to see how much game was made in just this tiny deck of cards. And I find this incredibly rewarding. If you like trick ticky games and if you have a trick to game night where lots of people show up, usually like once a week or once a month, like, like I do and some other people I know that do, this is an excellent one to have if you arrive early and then you're waiting for someone else to show up and it's just the two of you and you can play a quick game of this as you're waiting for more people to filter in for that night. So if you love trick taking and cats and two player games, then Catsy is definitely for you. Number 71 is Songbirds. My friend Jerry, this is his favorite game. Never play this game with Jerry because he will destroy you and ruin your life. Songbirds is another excellent example of a game that's more than the sum of its parts. Essentially, it's just a deck of cards and a few tokens. That's it. In this game, you're taking these deck of cards and you're evening them out amongst all the players. So everyone has a hand of cards. And then you're slowly playing these cards on a grid of five by five. It becomes a nice area majority game where you are slowly trying to see who has the strongest bird in each row and column. And each row and column, are they're not equal because some are worth like 12 points, some are worth fewer points. But the twist of this game is that as you're slowly filling out this grid, as you're slowly seeing like who is going to be leading on which row and which column, you have to keep a card from your hand and that's going to be the bird that scores. Now you have no idea of who the other cards are going to be left over in your opponent's hands, but you can card count and you're slowly counting all the possibilities of like, okay, all the green birds are out, all the blue birds are out, all the white birds are out. Are you, are you, are you brown? He's brown or blue. He's brown or blue. Where are they? How much points do they have? And it's really, really interesting. Uh, this game plays from one to four. The solo game is, is okay. I, I would replay it uh, every now and then. And there's even a team-based version of the game, which again, I think is okay. I think the game really plays its best uh, when it's four players being competitive. And again, this rises up more than the sum of its parts, I think. And the artwork is really cute, very beautiful. All the birds look absolutely fantastic. So if you're looking for a nice little card game that fits in your backpack that you can play with other people in roughly 20 minutes, but still offers a lot of really good decision work, I think Songbirds is an excellent choice and an excellent game to add to your collection. And don't be fooled by all this cute artwork. Like Songbirds is a really, really mean game. It feel really good at counting cards and slowly deducing like which bird each player is going for, you will absolutely destroy all the other players. I've seen it happen and his name is Jerry. <laughs> and that has been Songbirds, my number 71 of the best board games from Japan. Wait, where are you going? Don't leave. Because every video, I am giving away games from my collection to you. Some games are just from me and some games are from other publishers that have given me to give away in certain giveaways and prizes. And so we have another copy of Planet Peter that we are giving away in this video. Sure, how do I get those games? Easy, follow the link below in the description and you'll find a Google form, so just fill that out. And then before our next video, I'll select the lucky winner and reach out to you. And you will win this copy of Planet Peta. And this is your future copy of Planet Peta. Once again, gamers, my name is Jay. I play board games from Asia and share what I find with all of you. I'm gonna put some links up here, do some videos that I think you'll enjoy. See you there.
my show. Okay, now you're show.